developer track day three. Um, we have an interesting talk here from Columbia University, Steve Feiner. Feiner, uh, for what's next? Procuring upcoming actions in AR and VR. So um, we're looking forward to this one. I think I think what's next is uh, what we're all waiting for since, you know, what's next week, right? Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to, to hearing Steve uh, um, kind of cover some of these uh, AR and VR influences on the presence, but really where it's going in the future. So please, uh, Steve, take it away. Thank you very much. Sure. So the talk title is a bit ambiguous. I'm not going to be talking about the future of AR, but rather the future of what happens within an individual user interface. Um, so what I'm going to be discussing is one of the most fundamental things that we do in real life, as well as also in VR and AR, and that is queuing, you know, basically being told what it is that we're going to do right now. Okay. And so in uh, the physical world, you know, signing on the signature line, turning the little thing on the door to unlock it, uh, traffic signs, for example, are all telling us what we're going to be doing right now. Okay? Now, this is in the physical world. Of course, this happens in VR and AR as well. Uh, AR and VR go back over a half century. My lab has been working only a bit more than 30 years in the field. This is some of our earlier work done in the early 90s. Um, with an optical see-through AR display showing queuing of uh, a task of pulling a paper tray out of a laser printer. We go a little bit later, we're looking at putting uh, the top of a combustion chamber on top of the bottom part of it, uh, handheld freehand rotation of an object, and you're seeing additions being added to the real world over here that are instructing a person what to do and how to do it. And here's another example. Um, of a remote person in VR, a remote subject matter expert, advising a local technician on how to perform a task, in this case, putting a, uh, a gear on top of an, or on an axle, okay? Really fundamental basic stuff in instructional AR and VR, okay? Now, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today is pre-queuing. We use that term to refer about presenting information about future actions, not the ones that you're doing right now, but rather the ones that you'll be doing in the future, the ones that we'll be doing next or after the next one. Now, again, in the real world, this is very common. If you look at conventional Western musical notation, you're not only seeing the notes that you're gonna be playing right now, you're gonna see the notes that are gonna be played next in a measure, measures beyond that, maybe even pages beyond that. This is really classic stuff. We do it all the time. Um, in VR, you look at games like Beat Saber, you don't only see the notes that are the ones you're about to go and slash, hopefully correctly, but you see the ones that are coming down that musical highway next and next and next, all lined up basically, so you get the sense of what is gonna be happening next. And so what I'm gonna talk about is work that my lab has done over the past couple of years, trying to quantify some of the advantages and potentially disadvantages of pre-queuing information in AR and VR. So, what I'll do is talk about a set of studies that we've done. And the first one over here is simply about following a path in VR, um, literally holding a controller in one hand, no use of any buttons, and simply going from one location and another, which were being queued and pre-queued to do. Uh, this study was done um, during the heart of the pandemic. Our lab was closed down, and we actually were running the study in a way we don't like to, which is in the homes of the participants with their own setups, which is complicated in ways that you can barely even believe. Um, but let me show you what this looked like. So very simple environment, a bunch of these red dots. Uh, what you're seeing over here is a, uh, a big arrow. That's the initial cue to go to the dot the lower right, and then you're seeing successor pre-cues that are getting uh, thinner and darker and more transparent uh, off into the future. In this case, there are four pre-cues and one queue. This is a participant in uh, this user study, um, and what we're seeing here are some of the different things that we did to try to study. We looked at the number of pre-cues, zero pre-cues, one pre-cue, two, three, four, et cetera, and we looked at kinds of pre-cues. What you're seeing on the left had 
uh, lines with arrows. At the top, you're seeing lines with circles, lines without anything at, at the intersections between lines. So the, the classic line styles you'd see in something like PowerPoint. At the bottom, just the arrowheads, just the circles, again, getting smaller and uh, darker and more transparent as they get later on. So what does this look like? This is what it looks like when someone's actually doing this task. Literally just moving the controller around from one virtual place to another. And here we have someone who's a participant in uh, one of our pilot studies before we actually did the formal study. So what did we get out of this? Okay, it turns out that, not amazingly surprising, multiple pre-cues can actually decrease the time it takes you to perform a task. Having lines connecting those cues better than having no lines at all. Now, in our work, and notice the way in which things are moving around all over the place. Unlike things like Beat Saber or Dance Dance Revolution or a variety of rhythm games where things tend to come at you and they don't overlap except the ones that you do next may overlap the ones that come later, okay? In this case, that's not happening. And so two to three pre-cues were best when we were using ones that were connected with lines. Add more than that, people start doing less well. In this case, we were measuring how well they were doing by the amount of time they took to actually follow this path. When we had no lines at all, one pre-cue ended up being best. Add two pre-cues, three pre-cues, people actually got worse. And that may make some sense if you think about things like connect the dots. If I give you a whole bunch of number of dots and it's a hundred of them, right? You know, that'll keep a little kid occupied for a long period of time as they try to figure out what the next number is. If instead I have a hundred dots, but only let's say two or three numbers and their next two or three, that becomes very easy and very, very fast. So having too many pre-cues in that case ends up actually being bad. So let me tell you about another study. So here we're doing work in AR. And this, you know, we're not finally back in the lab. We're manipulating objects. The objects happen to be Vive trackers. They're great for determining their orientation and position. And this task involved a set of five trackers, uh, one also on the wrist, so we can track the, the hand. And what the person is instructed to do is to pick up a particular tracker, translate it, rotate it, and then put it down. The translation and rotation can be simultaneously. They can be do one first and the other one next. It uh, doesn't really matter. But when it gets put down and you're done with it, it has to be properly positioned and also oriented. So what does this look like? Here's an example. Um, what you're seeing over here are cyan lines that are pre-cueing movement. So here's an example over here. Um, this yellow line is cueing the user to the task object. In this case, it's this particular tracker, which they need to move over here. And for rotation, we have this set of wedges. There's a green wedge that shows the current orientation of the object, because a tracker is really uh, kind of ambiguous unless you look at little details. We didn't want people to do that. Um, and here is a wedge at the destination, and the idea is align this wedge, which moves with this tracker, so that it ends up oriented along with the wedge that we're seeing over here. And so in our study, we were looking at the numbers of pre-cues, the kinds of pre-cues, um, where we're going to show lines, wedges, combinations thereof, and also where the wedges lived, where the wedge is going to live on the object you were moving, on the destination, or in what you're seeing over here, one's on the object being moved, one's on the destination. So what does this look like? Here we see someone doing it. Pick up a tracker, orient the wedge, move and orient. And you'll notice this person is moving while they're orienting as well. And in each case, we go to one of those red dots. Okay, so we did a user study. I'm not giving you the low-level details. And normally in a conference talk, I would talk about the number of people and the demographics and, and a lot of really low-level stuff, which I'm not going to do. I'm happy to talk about afterwards. You're welcome to look at the papers. Um, but the moral of the story over here was this ended up being best when the rotation information, those wedges, was split between the object and the destination, which is what you're seeing over here. Green wedge on the object about to be moved and a gray wedge on the destination. Now, it was also best with only one movement pre-cue. So what's a movement pre-cue? And now it gets a little tricky, okay? Here you're seeing 
one line, one cyan line, you're seeing a pair of wedges, but over here there's another pair of wedges which contain rotation information, okay? And what was best was two lines, which you're not seeing, and one wedge set, because you need the wedge set to actually do the rotation of the object you're moving, or one line and two wedge sets, as you're seeing over here. Now, I said it was best with one movement pre-cue. Now, this you might think of as being a rotation pre-cue, but it also pre-cues movement because there is that red circle where it's supposed to go. There is that green wedge at the source, the gray one at the destination. And as it turned out, we got a little bit suspicious about what was going on, and we ended up doing a study in which we did what you're seeing over here, where the two wedges for the pre-cue have different orientations, indicating how much to rotate. We also tried it where before you got to that tracker to pick it up, the green wedge and the gray wedge were at the same orientation. So the gray wedge was oriented the same way, which would imply no rotation at all. And only when you actually got to it did we give you the information that you needed by then orienting the gray wedge. So this is something we tried in addition to what you're seeing over here. And it turned out that in a very small study we did just of that, out of eight people in the study, seven out of eight had no idea we were doing this. And we asked them afterwards, they didn't realize we had actually changed things around on them. They really were not using that orientation information for the pre-queue. They were only using it for the queue, which of course they would have to to actually do it correctly. Now, that said, it turns out the first author, the developer of this work, the student who did most of the work on it, um, he could actually, over time, effectively use a rotation pre-queue. So unsurprisingly, with a lot of practice, someone can actually get good at doing things that with less practice, there wasn't a lot of practice time in our study, with less practice a person couldn't do which is, again, not surprising. There's plenty of sports and uh, musical instruments in which if you walk up to them and try to play them, you're not gonna do very well, okay? And yet with skill and experience, you can get better and better and better at it. Now, having said that, it turns out that there are cases in which we can have novices, people just learned how to do stuff in our study, actually take advantage of rotation pre -cues. We did another study where we had these Vive trackers now screwed into the board with a quarter 20 uh, uh, thread on, on the back of the tracker. Um, and now we had rotation cues and pre cues on the same object. And it turned out that people who had just a little bit of experience got quite good at using multiple pre cues in this particular uh, task, which didn't involve moving from one place to another. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is, again, you know, one more turn around the wheel. Now we're looking at what we refer to as bimanual unordered concurrent tasks. And that's just a fancy way of saying both hands, as opposed to only one hand at a time, which is what we were using before. Single hand was being used for all of what I just showed you. But now it's going to be both hands. The order in which you do things is going to be up to you at this point. It's not going to be a strict order and you can do things at the same time. In this case, you can pick up two things and move them simultaneously. And this is a VR study. You can see the headset and the controllers we're using over there on the right. And I'll show you in a second what the task looks like, but at a high level, it consists of a set of individual tasks, individual actions. There is these blue cylinders the cylinder is connected by a colored line to a semi-transparent replica of it, and you need to pick up the a cylinder, whichever one you want to, and move it to its designated destination. Okay? This is what things look like schematically from the top down. We had eight objects, eight virtual objects. They go to eight different destinations on a virtual tabletop around one and a half meters wide. And already you can see that even with just eight objects, there's a lot of stuff going on over here. And if you imagine this being 16 or 32 or 64, computer scientists love Paris of two, um, this would turn into a spaghetti bowl. You don't want it to have, if you're trying to effectively queue and pre-queue, you don't want to have all of those queues being active. And so what we decided on was to show a subset of the possible queues rather than all of them, because you're only going to be able to do two at a time anyway. And the look ahead, it just is not going to work for looking ahead to dozens, for example, maybe not even two or three. So we're going to show a subset of the possible queues. 
And that is going to raise the question of which ones. Let me show you an example of what this looks like. In this case, two cues are being shown at a time. And I'm not calling them cues or pre-cues because you decide which one or ones you want to do first. So actually with two, you could select both of them, grab them and move them, or you could do one versus the other. At any given time, there'll be two cues. As soon as you follow one of them, the, another one is going to appear. So there'll always will be two, except at the very end, where it'll be one and then there'll be zero when you're done. So here we see a person picking these things up, moving them around, works nice, quite nicely, and they're done. So the question is, how does the number of cues, in this case, affect performance? Can selecting cues adaptively improve performance? So we're looking at, is there a way in which instead of having you being given uh, sort of in lockstep a set of things to do and at a time, what if we simply let you help determine which things are actually being queued? So I'm going to show you three different approaches to doing this. The first one is indeed static, which means there's a set, an ordered set of cues, and we're going to start peeling them or popping them off the stack in the order in which they're going to occur. And as soon as you do one, the next one comes in, and then the next one comes in, et cetera. And so this is what it looks like. In any given time, you're going to see three cues active. And we just finished. Now, here's another approach. This one is adaptive. We're going to bring into the cue set, the, the set of visible cues, the ones that correspond to the ones that your controller was closest to, where closest means below a certain threshold. Okay? And so we're going to bring these cues into the cue set. And so here we're going to see a little demonstration of this. This is not what you would really do during the study. The person's just moving their controllers around just to point out that it's the things that are closest to the controllers. And at all times, it'll be, in this case, the three things that were the most recently closest within that threshold. Let's try one more. The headset we're using, it's a Vario XR3, has eye tracking. We're taking advantage of eye tracking over here. But one important thing is, you see that little cyan dot over here? That is in the slides I'm showing you right now. It is not in the user interface that we use in the study. Now, I put that in there because these are not your eyes. This is not your head looking around. You have no idea what this person is looking at, and that cyan dot's going to let you know what they're actually doing. But they're not seeing that cyan dot there. So let's try that. And again, as you can see them glancing around, you know, they're bringing things into the cue set. Again, that's just sort of a demonstration of what the eye tracking is doing. And now you're seeing the person actually doing this. Okay, now, there is interestingly a problem with this kind of stuff. And in eye tracking, we often call it the Midas touch problem, right? You look at something and, you know, it, it turned into gold. You didn't really want it to turn into gold. You wanted to eat it, right? And now you've got a golden hamburger and you're not going to be able to eat it, okay? Here, you're currently seeing two cues that are in there. The eye is looking at the blue one at the top over there. Everything looks fine. In the trial I'm going to show you, I'm going to give you a pre-cue about what's going on, okay? You're going to see the person reach for one of these guys over here. It's probably going to be this one. And as they reach for it, they're going to actually look at something else, and that means that this cue is going to come out of the cue set, and they're going to go like, and they're going to sort of go, huh? And they're going to go back a little bit, okay? That gets very confusing. So let's watch that happen over here. Again, keep your eyes on what's happening over there. So the person, uh, uh, and they sort of back up a little bit, and then they grab another one. You know, and this, this can get confusing unless you're really disciplined at what you look at, and you shouldn't have to be that way. And so given that problem, we decided to see if there was something we can do, since eye tracking was looking like it was working really well. It's great for selecting things. We didn't want to make you have to dwell on something for a while to select it, because that's going to slow you down. And so what we did basically is what we call locking. So what does that mean? So. Here is a set of three cues that you're seeing here. We've got two controllers, the left and right controllers. And the idea is that when you get with, with a controller, the controllers are what you use to actually move stuff. When you get within a certain threshold of a queued object, it's going to get locked into the set, so it's not going to go out of the set 
no matter where you look, no matter what you do with your hands, until you've actually done something with it, until you've moved it to its destination in this case. Okay? Now, here we have a person getting closer to that cylinder, the red cylinder there with their left controller. And again, like that cyan dot, I am showing lock cues in red for these slides. They're not actually turning to red in the study itself. You don't see this happening. You don't see the blue dot. You don't see the things turning red. Okay, but I'm doing that for the sake of the uh, slides. And here the right controllers move closer, and now we basically have two uh, things that have been locked into the set. So let's see what this looks like. This is slow motion now. We've gone down to, uh, I think it's down at half speed, okay? Um, and you're going to see as we now in slow motion moves, you'll see the, the little cyan dot, and you'll see things turning red as they get locked into the set because of the controller proximity. And this just feels a whole lot better. and People actually perform better with this because they're not worrying about well, if I look in the wrong place. And of course, it's hard not to look in the wrong place. And then suddenly you've got to back off because you don't know where the thing goes. And here this works very, very nicely. So we did a user study. I said I was not going to do detail. I'll do a little bit over here. This one was 15 participants. Um, five different cue set updating approaches, the static one I showed you, hand proximity and eye gaze with and without locking, um, three different numbers of cues. We had two cues, three cues, and four cues. And we had, in other words, five times three, five updating mechanisms, three numbers of cues, that's 15, eight time trials for each one of those 15 conditions, 120 trials per participant, plus some practice trials at the very beginning. And so the take home lessons are for the number of cues, adding a third cue actually reduces the task completion time when compared to two. Adding more than that really does not help, okay? Average across the different mechanisms. Um, eye gaze approaches, each one of them was faster than the hand proximity approaches, again, averaged across the number of cues. In most cases, the eye gaze and hand proximity approaches were better than the static approach. And locking reduced task completion time makes things more efficient for both the eye gaze and hand proximity mechanisms, again, averaged across number of cues. And so, one final slide, high level take home uh, lessons and conclusions, pre-cues can help but not too many. You can pile on too many pre-cues and make things kind of like a spaghetti bowl full of a hard to understand mess. Connecting lines works really well for pre-cueing movement, connecting stuff at one place to another place. Rotation, when it happens at a different place than you're working at and concentrating at right now, pre-cues don't work well for novices. Again, a highly practiced student who had, was actually running the studies and had done them many, many times himself, was actually able to benefit from a rotation pre-cue. And locking cues in those adaptive cue sets, as I explained, turns out to actually be very helpful. So at this point, I will acknowledge my uh, co-authors uh, on the different studies I showed you, the funding agencies, um, and I hope have time, a couple of minutes, for questions. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. So in a class like you used to do a lot of work with uh, 2D navigation, which is uh -huh. not bits of text. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you see this kind of work becoming the next way to start to assess navigation performance within AR and VR and VR? Well, there already are uh, sort of online standardized versions of the Fitz Law tests. Um, and this just gets a lot more complicated because you're doing more than just positioning, going from one place to another, right? In this case, you're also maybe rotating something. We have later work that involves rotating and with a full three degrees of rotational freedom. Um, and other work in which you're working at one place and then you're going to turn to another place to work and then go back to the original place. So I see a lot of different ways in which this stuff uh, could end up being potentially standardized. 
but there's so many different variations, right? Fitz Law is so simple, right? Which is why it's wonderful, okay? But even then, the first Fitz Law was literally just someone tapping back and forth, you know, in literally in one dimension. And it wasn't until many years later that people actually did Fitz Law with full 2D <laughs> on a regular screen. A lot later than you might expect that it was. Anybody else? I hope I didn't completely fluster all of you. I know I was speaking a bit quickly. <laughs> Ask me questions. That's what I'm here for. I'll do a follow-up. Yes, please. So you've heard about how the context of the AR is important. Yes. So mm -hmm. beyond the, the notion of this law, now we start thinking about how does, how does each boil down to design guidelines. Yes. 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 And so I can imagine situations where not only you have the experts sort of provide the tools to and make the design tools you guys are covering, but also the tools for developers in creating those things. What's the next step in boiling these insights down into kind of rules and stuff? Good question. Um, I tried to come up with a couple of rules of thumb at the end over here. They're very, very high level, right? And some of them really, they're not like always do X, right? Because a lot of this depends, right? Pre-cues can help. I said not too many. In music notation, it's not like, gee, another page. You know, that's not going to be a problem, OK? Because nothing overlaps anything. Dance Dance Revolution, you could have a long scroll, not a problem. You know, Beat Saber, the ones that are closer to you are the ones you have to hit first. Seeing more context, maybe it doesn't help seeing, you know, 20 off into the future. Uh, on the other hand, it's not really going to hurt you. Maybe it might confuse you a little, but if they were coming from all over the place, right? If they were enemy craft coming this way and that way, uh, it's probably best to see the ones that are going to be the most dangerous to you first, rather than seeing the other ones that could confuse you, unless you're trying to make the game harder, right? You know, and indeed, you know, that's a, a tactic in virtual war and in real war, fluster the enemy, right? By raining down more things on them they can understand, okay? Um, so I think really some of it maybe is the rotation issue, of in which I have to do things at other places. And we've so far seen very little benefit, at least for novices, okay, of rotation pre-cues at other places. In the same place, turning a knob around a lot, no problem, okay? With a limit to the number you can have. Uh, at different sites, on the other hand, not, but again, as I mentioned, the uh, student who did the, the development of this was able to actually make use of a rotation pre-queue, and uh, two students, he was one of them in the very first project I talked about, again, with a lot of experience, they were actually, they didn't get to use more of those translational cues, but they were able to work faster than the folks who had done a couple of trials and then were actually doing the study. Hardly surprising, again, people, Olympic athletes, they're, they're special people, in part because they were born that way, but in part because they trained a hell of a lot to get to the point at which they can do things that we can't, and then they worry about shaving a tenth of a second or less off of time, okay? And so I think maybe more and more we're going to see, and we're already seeing it with Beat Saber. People post these things to YouTube, and I look at them and I go, oh my God. Now, it may have taken a year for them to get that way, and it may have been one of many, many trials. It was the one that finally worked, and then they posted it, right? A lot of people don't post fails, right? Some people do, and they're proud of it, especially if they get hurt. Um, tooth comes out, there's plenty of skateboarding videos with people having bad things you wouldn't want to have happen to your kids, happen to them, and they're, they're grinning afterwards, right? <laughs> it takes a special kind of person. Um, so I think, you know, th there's some high level things I can, I can give you, but the lower level things are, you know, all I can say is do studies, right? They can be informal ones, the companies already do this, they can be formal ones, and what we do is we do formal studies preceded by informal ones, and we also publish our results. Anyone else? I think I have a minute or two left. Surely there's somebody else who has a question. Comment? 
No. No one. Ah, saved by the bell. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll stick around if you have any questions you want to come up with. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome.